I think we're ready to start. So hello everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on pooled green bond financing for municipalities. The webinar is part of a project developed by the Climate Bonds Initiative and FMDV Global Fund for Cities Development with the support of Climate Kick. I'm Diletta Giuliani from the Climate Bonds Initiative and here with me today we have Lars Anderson and Jean-Francois Abo from FMDV and Bjorn Bergstrand from Commune Invest who will all be speaking on the webinar today. Together we'll be talking you through the opportunities for municipalities to access finance for low carbon and climate resilient infrastructures through pooled financing mechanisms. Before we begin, I would just like to go over some basic housekeeping. This webinar is scheduled for an hour. The presentations will take about 45 minutes and then we will open for questions. You can write your questions at any point during the webinar by using the Q&A panel that you will see on the right-hand uh, side of the, your webinar platform. Uh, all attendees will be muted, so if you have any questions at any point during the panel, please do write it um, as, as we go along. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available to participants uh, and will be also on our YouTube channel shortly after the presentation. I would now like to pass the floor to Lars Anderson and Jean-Francois, who will take us through the benefits and processes of setting up pooled financing mechanisms for municipalities. Hey, Diletta, just uh, to, uh, to, to tell that uh, for Mika, and his, uh, it's right to me, and he doesn't uh, get uh, anything from the audio on his computer, so I don't know if everybody else can hear us or not. Okay. I'm sure that the other people can hear us, but... Uh... Audio is... Okay, these are Linton said. Just one second. So, can all loud and clear is what I'm getting from some of the participants as well. So, some that may not be hearing could be because they have not connected their audio, unfortunately. So, uh, it seems now that we're getting many comments that think that they can actually hear us. So thank you everyone actually for being very active on that and telling us that, that you can hear us loud and clear. So I will now then pass uh, the, um, the presentation to Lars Anderson and Jean-Francois Abo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello everyone, this is Lars Anderson and um, I think that, that I could start and, and Jean-Francois will, will join in later. Um, uh, I would want to talk to you about um, uh, uh, pooled financing for local authorities. And um, uh, pooled financing for local authorities, um, it's, a, it's a kind of cooperation between our local authorities. And um, you could do it in both the basic way, and that is to join together and to a bond issue where all the local authorities in this bond issue will responsible, be responsible for their own part of the bond issue. Uh, or you can go on to the next level where you create a special purpose vehicle between the local authorities and the capital market. The special purpose vehicle then issue bonds in the capital market and then on then the proceeds to the local authorities. This special purpose vehicle is often called uh, local government funding agency. And um, there are a number of advantages um, uh, of uh, these um, entities. First of all, it gives the access to, ca to the capital market for small, small and medium sized local authority while it um, diversify the funding for big cities. So it gives incentives for, incentives for all sizes of local authorities to be joining a um, uh, pooled financing um, project. It has in all cases, the way we have seen, reduced cost, the cost of borrowing, and it reduces also the pr processing costs connected to doing bond issues in, in the capital market. It reduces risk through diversification, and also through the fact that well, if you look at local authorities, local authorities are there to provide a basic service to, to the inhabitants. It's not their role to be financial experts, but an entity, a local government funding a, a agency could employ experts at which will reduce even further the risk of, of working in the capital market. It also gives incentives uh, to improve creditworthiness because 
the agency is totally reliant on the credit worthiness of the local authorities. So then they, there need to be in place systems for monitoring this credit worthiness. And this creates sort of a peer pressure uh, among the members of, 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 of an agency to improve the credit worthiness. And there is nothing more efficient than peer pressure to improve credit worthiness in, in local authorities. Uh, it is also a conduit for transfer, the transfer of knowledge. Uh, I know that uh, many of these agencies, they, they do seminars, they, they have different ways of, of, uh, um, of giving information to the, to the local authorities. Very important is that it increases transparency. Transparency is um, a key word when working together because local authorities need to trust each other and the agency. But it's also a fact that the capital market would need transparency when you do bond issues. And often together with the agencies, the local authorities are developing debt strategies at the local level. So, so there, is, there would be a number of, of uh, advantages with, with this kind of uh, local government funding agencies. You can find them uh, in many parts of the world. And if we first look at Europe, the oldest one is the Danish one that was created in 1898. It's an association where all the Danish uh, local authorities are members, and it's built upon the pr principle of one member, one vote, which is the same for the Swedish uh, Communivest. Uh, I took the initiative to create the Communivest in 1986, and it's also an asso uh, association and today he's got somewhere between 90 to 95 per percent um, uh, of um, uh, all local authorities as members. Maybe Bjorn could verify that later. Uh, Munifin is a slightly different because it has a majority ownership from local authorities, but also a minority ownership from, from the central government and the, gov the municipal pension fund. The Norwegian is owned by the state, working very closely together with local authorities. And in the Netherlands, we got two agencies, one for the water authorities and one for sort of regular local authorities. The latest edition is um, the, the French Agence France Locale, and I'm on the board of that agency now. And um, recently also, we have seen the birth of the UK Municipal Bond Agency. But looking out to different parts of the world, we could see uh, these agencies or, or similar types of, of entities in many countries. Maybe first of all, in the US, we have the municipal bond banks and in Canada, the, the provincial bond banks. And uh, these are often owned by, by the state or the, or the province. Um, there are some exceptions to, to that rule, and, and one would be the, the one in British Columbia, which is, so, which is owned by the local authorities, and the one in Florida, which is also owned by, by local authorities, otherwise they're owned by the state. Uh, this model of um, uh, municipal bond bank has been, been also exported to, to Mexico, where you find it in, in some uh, uh, states. Um, looking over to Japan, um, the JFM is owned by, by local government to 100%. It used to be a state-owned entity in, in, until 2008, but then it was transferred to, to the local, local authorities. In New Zealand, you have the, LG, you have the LGFA, New Zealand, uh, majority owned by local authorities and with a minority stake from, from uh, central government. I've been working with, um, uh, with pool financing for, for quite a long time. And I, for me, I could identify some core values, which is, uh, I think should be there in order for you to, to be successful in cooperating with other municipalities. One is the equality. I think that all local authorities should be treated equal. Of course, there could be exceptions, but these need to be logical and fair. Transparency, we already talked about that before. It's needed to, to get the, the corporation working in a proper way. So the, both from, from the agency's point of view to, to local authorities, from local authorities to the agency and to the capital market. Thirdly, involvement. This is local, the local authorities project. It's their project. 
they need to feel responsibility for for this project to, to and bring it uh, further in the case of Sweden and France, we have had a system where we've tried to divide the political roles and, and the professional roles. So uh, there is a, a parent company, you can say, uh, which has a board of mayors uh, from the local authorities. And the, the, this board's responsibility is, of course, the overall stra strategy, questions related to, to the local authorities that are members. and um, then we have the daughter company, the professional level, uh, which um, have a board with a majority of external experts, and there all the financial activities are handled. And it, this has been a very useful model in, in these two countries to divide the, the political roles and the professional roles. Pool financing. Uh, does not in any way remove the local decision-making powers of the local authorities. They can still decide when to borrow, how much to borrow, which maturity they want for their, their loans. And um, it is also a fact that these uh, entities work in an open competition with other uh, lenders to local authorities and, and the offers from the agency should be compared with others. Um, both as um, a way of measuring the su success of, of the agency, but also to, to keep a healthy capital market alive in the countries. Starting uh, or, or, or starting a process to to uh, to um, create a, a local government funding agency is in some ways a lengthy process it, it, it's very different in different countries for some countries it has taken some 10 years and from, from others it has taken a couple of years but um, you need and it surely is a learning process you need to have a small group of um, uh, of um, representatives of local authorities that will are driving this this project but then involve all the participating local authorities in workshop to discuss creditworthiness, governance, supervision, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, uh, there, there, uh, as I said, it uh, it, it could involve uh, to, to do firstly some club deals before you actually create the agency. But um, it is a very useful process in in every way and. Um, Hopefully, it leads up to, to creating an agency. So that was a very, very short and uh, uh, a summary of, um, of what pool financing is. And um, I'll be happy later on to, to, to uh, answer your questions. I pass uh, uh, the word on to, to Jean-François. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Lars. And, uh, Hello everyone uh, who is following this uh, online. Uh, so first of all, uh, maybe in the two words to present uh, FMDV. FMDV is a, a network of cities that is uh, dedicated to promote and develop financial uh, solutions to, uh, to finance uh, urban development. And so for us, why we, uh, we, um, we worked on promoting and developing uh, pool financing uh, together with uh, Lars Anderson and, uh, and some uh, other organizations and experts. It's because uh, the f on the figures, in the last 15 years, uh, pool finance have mobilized more than one trillion US dollar for um, developed uh, countries from the capital market and uh, three billion US dollar from the uh, emerging and uh, development uh, countries. And so it is a, a real, um, uh, catalyzer of uh, private finan finance to, uh, to support urban investment, either in, uh, in developed countries, but also in, uh, in uh, uh, emerging and developing countries. And so that's why we, um, um, we, made a, we put a lot of effort also in uh, advocating uh, in the international agenda to, uh, to make the countries and the, uh, the DFIs uh, recognize the, the important role of, uh, of uh, those mechanisms to, uh, to finance and accelerate the urban transition. And uh, so thanks to the support from uh, France and, uh, and Mexico, we, uh, we advocate for the recognition of uh, subnational pool financing uh, mechanisms during the, uh, the uh, 
financing for development conference in uh, in uh, Addis Ababa, and uh, and then uh, during the uh, Habitat 3 conference in um, in, uh, in Quito, and uh, in both uh, resolutions, subnational pool financing have been recognized as uh, catalyzers and accelerators to. Uh, to uh, finance the implementation of uh, the global objectives um, on uh, for cities. So among the, uh, the the practical things, I think uh, it's good also to uh, to know that uh, now those mechanisms are in the uh, in the scheme of uh, the international agendas, and that uh, most of the donors now are, are also interested to to see how to explore those mechanisms in uh, different countries and to use those mechanisms to, uh, to finance both uh, big cities, but also secondary cities. And, uh, and for example, uh, as FMBV, we contributed to uh, introduce those mechanisms in different countries, such as South Africa, Colombia, Peru, Uganda, Western African countries, and most, uh, more recently uh, with uh, CBI, uh, Romania, and Bulgaria. So that was my just few comments I wanted to add to the to the presentation from from Lars. So up to you, Diletta. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-François and Lars. So the next part of the webinar will cover green city bonds, or how cities can raise finance uh, targeted ad at addressing environmental issues such as pollution, floods, droughts, and waste management through green bonds, and obviously how they can do it through pooled green financing mechanisms as well. So just first of all a brief introduction. So green bonds are fixed income instruments where the proceeds are used to finance green projects and assets. Any entity that can issue a bond can also issue a green bond provided it owns the assets. A green city bond is therefore a bond, a green bond uh, issued to finance green urban infrastructure. The green label enables issuer to demonstrate that assets are climate aligned and allows investors to easily discover them. The green bond market has been growing exponentially over the past few years, especially driven by a strong investor demand. Uh, so far, more than half a trillion US dollars worth of green bonds have been issued around the world. The green bond market was born as a voluntary market. Uh, with banks soon developing guiding principles called the Green Bond Principles that basically provided good mar market practice on the disclosure and reporting on behalf of issuers. At the international level, we also have the Climate Bond Standard and Certification Scheme, which is operated by the Climate Bonds Initiative, and that has been used by green bond issuers globally. Um, you can see from the map in the slide that in the past few years, several regulators, stock exchanges, and industry associations have also acted to provide guidance to their d domestic markets, either in the form of regulation, uh, of listing requirements, or of guidebooks, all with the aims of scaling up issuance. There are several more that are in the pipeline, such as the European Commission, that is currently working through a technical expert group on developing such guidance. Now, green bonds can be used to finance really a wide variety of different assets and projects from all sectors in the economy. And you can see also here in the slide, so a snapshot of the climate bonds taxonomy, which is essentially a guide to climate aligned assets and projects uh, that has been developed through the climate bonds initiative, but mainly with the support of technical experts, industry representatives, as well as investor groups. And you can see it covers really from energy, the, the really main ones, energy transport buildings, but also water, agriculture, waste, uh, and some are in the pipeline, such as ICT and industry. Now, there are many benefits uh, for issuing a green bond. Um, the, the main feedback we have received from issuers when we speak to them has been uh, the access to new investors. So these are investors that are only interested in the issuance because it is green. So it enables clearly the issuer to access uh, new investors and have new investors come to the table. The, this, over, uh, this higher demand and oversubscription uh, can also sometimes lead, in, has some in, in some cases led to some pricing benefits, but this is not true of, of all the cases. Um, and of course, the other big benefit that we have seen from issuers have been, has been an enhanced reputation of the issuer uh, that, that shows through the issuance of a green bond commitment to a decarbonization strategy. Or for example, in the case of a city, it shows commitments to its climate 
uh, goals or on its pollution target. Now, green city bonds have been issued worldwide. You can see the U.S. has been a big part uh, of this growth, especially thanks to a very active municipal bond market. Europe has also been um, an important uh, region, uh, especially thanks to the presence not only of cities that are issuing, but also of uh, local utilities, uh, transport authorities, and of course, uh, municipal banks and local government funding agencies that have also raised finance through these instruments for green urban infrastructure. There has been some issuance also in, in developing countries. So we can see, for example, Africa, Johannesburg and uh, Cape Town have both issued green bonds. And in Latin America, we have had several provinces and, of course, uh, Mexico City that has issued a green bond as well. Um, the green bonds to date has, has been used mainly for transport and water assets. Buildings is also increasing, uh, while waste remains still an underserved sector for this type of instrument. Now, um, issuing a green bond is quite simple, but there are some additional steps that need to be done um, compared to just a traditional bond issuance. And these have to do both with a preparation phase and then with the issuance phase. So in the preparation, it is important that the issuer uh, set up a green bond framework and identify qualifying green projects and assets. So the main, really the, the key thing to issuing a green bond is to identify eligible projects and assets. It is the best market practice to also arrange an independent review. So have a consultant or a third party uh, verifier to provide a second party opinion or a certification, for example, in the form of the climate bond certification to, to confirm that the assets and the process that the issuer has undergone to select them are indeed eligible. The issuer should also set up some kind of tracking and reporting system to make sure it can track the proceeds and then show to the investors that the proceeds have indeed been used um, for the projects identified. Uh, the, the, second, the final steps are really to do with the issuance, so obviously there is uh, the issuance of, of the green city bond, and afterwards there is a monitoring of the use of proceeds and an annual report to the investors about where the proceeds have been used. When we talk about city bonds, we think uh, about several types of issuers, so as we mentioned, local governments, but also public utilities, transport authorities, local funding, government agencies, and municipal bond banks. So just one last note then before I pass the floor on to uh, Bjorn, who will take us through the experience of Communinvest as both a green, uh, sorry, as both a pooled financing mechanism, but also an issuer of green bond. Just to say that um, through this project, we really identified how green bonds and pooled funding mechanisms are indeed complementary in the sense that they enhance certain aspects that both um, both of these uh, items want, want to deliver. So the first is the di uh, diversity of funding sources. So we mentioned, obviously, Lars was also mentioning that um, it is important, these types of mechanisms are important for second tier cities that perhaps can't access capital markets on their own to actually access these, these investors that invest in, green, in bonds, and also for the bigger cities that are looking for a diversity from their funding sources. And we have seen that green bonds, by bringing green investors to the table, actually help to further diversify funding sources. The other element is transparency. When a pooled funding mechanism is set up, there is a big um, care taken to the type of project that it will finance and how, the, how the, the, the tracking of funds and how they will be used. And this is also a really fundamental part of uh, issuing a, a green bond uh, because, of course, there needs to be an attention to how the money is used compared um, to what the issuer said it would use it for. And finally, it's the creditworthiness. So uh, pooled funding mechanisms um, help to bring cities together in a creditworthy entity that can then access capital markets. And this is, of course, is a key part of issuing a bond, uh, since the credit profile is really the main thing that investors will look at uh, in bond issuance. So through these, um, through pooled funding mechanisms, there, there can also be a care that cities are maintaining their credit profile and that the bonds issued are of, are of high quality. So this is just a few notes to say how these two items really go well together, which is why, uh, as uh, Jean-Francois was mentioning, the project looks at pooled financing mechanisms and then especially how green bonds can be used uh, through these platforms. 
So I would now like to pass the floor to Bjorn Bengtsson from Communinvest, who will take us through the experience of Communinvest, both uh, as a food funding mechanism and also as a green bond issuer. Um, Bjorn, I think if you unmute yourself, then you should have presenter right now and should be able to go through the slides yourself. I'm Head of Sustainability at uh, Kommuninvest, which is a Swedish local government funding agency uh, set up in 1986 by 10 local governments uh, and following an idea uh, that Lars, who we listened to previously, uh, came up with. So, so my presentation today will focus uh, firstly on Communivest as, uh, as a pooled uh, funding vehicle, uh, and secondly, uh, on our experience uh, in issuing green bonds. But just a, a brief history. Since, since our starting days in, two, in 1986 by 10 local governments, we have grown quite substantially. Uh, today, the Communivest cooperation encompasses 288 Swedish local governments. There are a total of 310 local governments, so we today uh, provide funding for more than 90% of all Swedish local governments. Uh, we, we are <coughs> backed by an explicit guarantee. I will come back to that. Uh, and this affords us an exceptionally strong um, credit rating. We're a double-A. Uh, AAA, AAA rated from both Moody's and Standard and Poor's, uh, and we today have a balance sheet of approximately 45 billion euros and a lending portfolio of around 35 billion uh, euros. Uh, we have a very simple business model. Our, uh, our core offering is to provide <coughs> loan financing for local government uh, investments in Swedish krona, and we pr solely provide um, this lending to Swedish local government entities. Uh, if, we, if we look at how we are structured, Lars touched upon this. So we represent the advanced level of pool funding, whereby uh, the local governments, our owners, have established a special purpose vehicle in a form of a credit market company uh, where all of the operations uh, are conducted. Uh, this has been the setup for a, <coughs> essentially since we were started. Uh, the cooperation was initially solely for the 10 local governments of uh, one region in Sweden, but in the early 1990s it was opened up for all Swedish local governments, and you can see this in the graph, uh, uh, that there is quite a big jump in membership uh, in the early 1990s. This was a time when the Swedish banking system experienced a severe crisis, uh, and there was a great need for a funding mechanism like Communinvest to be able to provide local governments with uh, funding for investments. In fact, during the the crisis years, it was very hard for, for the local governments to obtain uh, funding from the banking system, which was then the principal source of, of funding. Uh, and we have since grown, uh, as you can see, uh, particularly with regards to, to lending. Uh, our lending portfolio is now in excess of <coughs> 300 billion Swedish krona, uh, i.e. 30 billion euros. And we today account for approximately 50%, 5-0% of all the funding needs of the local government uh, uh, sector. A few words on, on the guarantee. So the owners, by becoming a member of, of Communivest, the owners enter into a joint and several guarantee arrangement whereby they undertake to guarantee all of the liabilities entered into by the, spe the special purpose vehicle, which is named Communivest i Sverige AB. This is a very strong form of, of guarantee. 
uh, and it means that from the investor perspective, all of the bonds issued by Communivest are explicitly guaranteed by all of the members, jointly and severally. It does not mean that the owners guarantee the other members of the collaboration. Uh, uh, so it's solely a guarantee, uh, which is in favor of the undertakings of the special purpose, uh, uh, special purpose vehicle. Uh, and the way it is organized under Swedish law means that it's in the theoretical case of uh, investors needing to use this guarantee, it's, um, uh, it's immediately enforceable under uh, Swedish law. But I'd like to underline that there has never, never been a case to date of Communivest defaulting on its payment commitments, and there has not, thus never been a case of uh, an investor uh, having to resort to making a claim uh, under this guarantee. The next slide is uh, uh, a slightly complex one, but uh, a very interesting one, in my opinion. Uh, it, it shows you on the, on the horizontal axis uh, the number of members of the collaboration. Uh, so there, it, it ends by 289. We actually have 288 members. And on the vertical axis, uh, it shows you the uh, uh, the market penetration for our loans with uh, the members. Uh, and if we start at the at the yellow line, this is in 2010. Uh, the graph shows you that approximately 45 of our members did not use um, 45 of our current members did not use the cooperation at all. And this is partly or primarily because they were not members uh, at that time, but you can also have uh, the case of an individual member not using uh, the loan facilities that Communivest provides. Whereas in 2010, some 10 or maybe 12 members had all of their financing with Communivest. Uh, and, and then the various uh, the curves show you the progression of the development uh, uh, of market penetration uh, throughout the years until 2018. Third quarter 2018 is the blue one. Uh, you can see that uh, material things have changed during this time period. We now have approximately 100 members which have all of their financing with Communivest, whereas it's only a very small minority, uh, 13, uh, who have uh, no, uh, no borrowing with Communivest. Uh, and in fact, more than 200, uh, some 220 members have more than 90% of their financing with Communivest. So this demonstrates that the Communivest collaboration actually provides such good value uh, to clients or to, to members that they choose to, play, to use their special purpose vehicle for the vast majority of their funding needs. Turning now to, to green funding. Uh, Green, we, we talked about green bonds uh, previously, uh, and this is something that Swedish local governments have been utilizing for some time. The city of Gothenburg was the world's first issuer of a municipal green bond in 2013. Uh, the, the Stockholm region uh, followed suit in 2014, and there have been uh, a few other municipalities issuing green bonds um, uh, into the market. Communivest is a mechanism, as you've understood, uh, that provides access to capital markets for its members. So we wanted to provide access to uh, the green bond market also for our members uh, and started in 2015 uh, to extend green loans uh, to members for specific projects that meet um, 
uh, environmental or climate objectives. Uh, these are loans that are very similar in, in terms to, to our normal loans, uh, with the only exception that we require information on the investment projects that are being financed. The graph to the right shows you the development of the green loans and the green bonds portfolio with the green loans in blue, the dark blue representing uh, uh, disbursements to projects and uh, the light blue representing uh, committed but not yet uh, disbursed funds. As we build up the green loans portfolio, uh, once <clears throat> the portfolio has gotten uh, large enough, sufficiently large enough, we finance the portfolio by issuing green bonds. We issued our first green bond in uh, March 2016 and has since issued another four uh, bonds. So our total green bonds issuance uh, amounts to five green bonds, uh, totaling some 2 billion euros uh, and making Communivas the uh, Sweden's largest issuer of green bonds. Uh, the way we manage our, our green program is such that the, the projects, the investment projects, are identified firstly by the members, uh, i.e. the municipalities and the municipality-owned companies. Uh, who identify the eligible projects or the projects that they deem to be eligible. Uh, and they then um, send in a specific loan application for a green loan, uh, which is being judged by the environmental committee, which is presented on this page. Uh, seven person strong committee, uh, primarily comprised of independent experts from the local government sector. So they are independent to Communivest. Uh, and they work with energy and climate issues on a daily basis within the, uh, the local governments. They evaluate the projects and judge whether they meet the eligibility criteria that we've set up or not. Uh, most of the projects that we finance are in relation to green buildings and renewable energy projects as uh, shown in the pie chart to the left. Uh, the third largest uh, category is uh, for water management projects, but in total we can <coughs> approve projects for up to eight different project categories. Uh, some of the projects that we are financed are highlighted on this slide. Um, as you can see, uh, it, it's a broad range of different um, investment projects ranging from various types of renewable energy projects, to green building projects, to public transport, uh, and to water management and waste management. Uh, the reason why we have such a broad framework is that we wanted to set up a framework that met uh, the very broad uh, investment pattern that we see uh, in the Swedish local governments. They are active across across the spectrum of their investment projects to meet uh, climate and um, environmental objectives. Right, so th this next slide is just to highlight what we see as one of the main benefits of, of green financing. Um, uh, this is a small uh, municipality, uh, small or small, uh, 50,000 inhabitants who deploy green finance to a very large degree uh, in their investment activities and where, where they have seen substantial benefits of utilizing green finance as a means to improve collaboration inside the municipality. By starting talking to the various departments inside the municipality, which is a requirement to obtain green financing, uh, they have been able to identify hurdles to, to green investments. They have taken away these hurdles and are now seeing a tenfold uh, uh, increase in solar energy investments as a result. To finalize, just, <clears throat> just to 
give you an idea of what we see as the main lessons learned and success factors now. This is for green finance. Uh, and the, the, the Swedish situation is relevant because or, or this takes the Swedish situation into account, uh, given that uh, a, a local government in Sweden can easily obtain financing for an investment project without, uh, without having to resort to the gr requirements of green financing. Green financing is a slightly more burdensome for the local government because um, uh, we at Communivest uh, require a certain amount of information from the projects in order to be able to approve them. We also require uh, reporting on, on a regular basis. So a green financing offer to a municipality needs to be very easy uh, to engage in and needs to be relevant. So it should be simple and straightforward. Uh, there should be no requirement for more data than is needed to be able to fulfill investor demands uh, for reporting. Uh, and we as an aggregating vehicle, we need to do everything we can in order to make this as simple a process as possible uh, for the local governments. Um, uh, and uh, I've also highlighted a number of of uh, possible avenues for scaling up uh, green finance, but I, I, I see that in the interest of time, I will leave that for the Q&A session if there are any questions around that. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Bjorn, for that very insightful presentation. Um, we have had uh, several questions asked by our audience, so I'm just going to uh, pick a few and um, pass them on to our speakers. So maybe this one is for Lars. So someone has been asking, what are the main challenges to setting up green pooled financing mechanisms in developing countries? Yes. Well, the main challenge, um, I would say, is um, credit worthiness. But then again, uh, it depends. It's different. The requirements for credit worthiness is different in, in, in um, depending on, on the situation in the country um, in question. Uh, but um, uh, credit worthiness is, is number one. Um, that needs to be uh, discussed very much and needs to be discussed among the local authorities and, and um, the local authorities together with, with central government need to discuss this as well because often the local government credit worthiness is depending on, on how transfers to, to from, from central government to local government works, say, are they stable and reliable and so on and so forth. The second question that is important to discuss is the legal situation in the country. Is cooperation between local authorities possible under the, the, the the, the legal framework of the country and um, what other obstacles will there be in, in the legal framework. And that this is, um, it could be some in some countries and, and, and in some others they, it's, um, it's really um, uh, easy and straightforward. But um, I think that these would be the two main questions to, to begin with, legal situation, credit worthiness of the local authorities. I hope Perfect. that answers the question. Otherwise, you will have Absolutely. to follow Absolutely. Maybe follow just it. then, before I pass, just there was one connected to it, which was asking, you know, do, do municipal governments need to have a good credit rating? And I think um, both through your presentation and Bjorn's, we have understood that uh, indeed they do, as they are, uh, in a way, they're, they're giving a guarantee to the entity that is being set up. Um, and could I just uh, could, could I just make a comment on that? Please, uh, please. It, it shouldn't it shouldn't be understood that they need to have an official rating from the rating agencies, but they need to have a sufficient credit worthiness. And as I said, this the the, the, the sort of the standard for this is different in different countries. Um, so, um, but it is a very important question. And of course, also through then setting up this entity, uh, th there can be an, a review of the credit worthiness of, of the members that want to be part of it. And 
um, my understanding as well is that there is a constant review of this credit worthiness. So uh, in case this credit worthiness is lost in a way, there is also the opportunity uh, to perhaps gain it back. Is that correct? It is. I just like let, let me briefly explain the system of the French agency. We have a scoring system from one to seven, where we where one is the best, the, the highest credit worthiness of the local authority. And but if you come below 5.99, then you're not allowed in to be a member of, of, of the agency until you improve your, your situation. And should you be a member and fall below this, you not you, you could not ask for loans until you regained your position above uh, uh, 5.99. So this is um, and this is done uh, yearly. You, they do an annual uh, review of all the local authorities uh, to see whether they uh, where they end up in the scoring system. Thank you very much, Lars. And Bjorn, I think this one is for you. So um, one of our participants is asking. In Community Invest experience, what were the most challenging steps to issuing a green bond? And another one also connected to that is, what were the main benefits of this green bond? And were there any also for Community Invest members? How were these passed on, if at all? Uh, well, um, just let me begin by <laughs> answering the, the last question. So, so. Uh, Commune Invest does not issue green bonds on behalf of a specific member. We solely issue green bonds on behalf of uh, all the members jointly. There are uh, certain uh, municipalities. Sometimes they are actually members of Commune Invest, but there are, there are certain municipalities that issue green bonds by themselves in the capital market. Uh, so, so in the Swedish green bond market, there may be bonds available from Communivest. We are the largest issuer, uh, but there could also be individual bonds uh, issued by individual uh, municipalities. So in terms of, of, of the challenges, I would actually say that the, uh, one, of, one of the major challenges was uh, getting this project on board internally. Uh, it was not entirely obvious that this was a product, uh, this is now in 2014, it, it was not entirely obvious that this uh, was a product that would be <coughs> demanded or, or greatly demanded by, by the clients and not everybody internally within Community West were convinced that this was, this was uh, an obvious uh, product that we should uh, engage in. Uh, so I would say that that was the uh, one of the major challenges uh, before get, getting it started in the first place. Um, and afterwards, uh, one of the major challenges has been in setting up the um, uh, <coughs> qualified reporting system for investors which was a challenge for Communivest because we are essentially a balance sheet uh, provider, uh, uh, finance provider. We, we typically do not have project expertise uh, in-house. So being able to report back uh, on the environmental benefits of the uh, projects that we finance has been, uh, has been a challenge for us, uh, but one we have overcome uh, by uh, by being smart and, and also by collaborating, actually. We have set up a Nordic collaboration between Communivest and other Nordic public sector issuers of green bonds with regards to uh, green bonds impact reporting, as it is called. Uh, and we have launched a position paper on green bonds uh, uh, impact reporting uh, to guide ourselves and to guide the market. So that has been very helpful. And that was one of the ways in which we overcame uh, that challenge. Actually selling the bonds has been the easiest part, I would say. Uh, there, should I continue? There was a, yeah. a, a, a sub, uh, another question related to the benefits uh, 
I would say that there are n numerous, numerous benefits. If we look at the pure, uh, fina if I call it financing benefits, and uh, uh, separate the answer into financing benefits and green benefits, if we start with the financing benefits, it's, it's clear that issuing a green bond adds investor diversification because it allows investors who previously have not bought you to become engaged since uh, at least part of the green bond buyers are buyers that would would only buy the bond if it is a labeled green bond uh, in our experience uh, probably half of the investors of in the five green bonds that we have issued have been uh, new investors or investors that have not bought us for a long time or in very small uh, amounts and have returned uh, to buying communal in, in, in larger quantities as a result of the issue being being green. Uh, so investor diversification, that, that is key to any funding strategy uh, and, and that uh, has improved through issuing green bonds. We also see that the, the, the green bond issues price uh, through the curve, uh, so we obtain uh, uh, cheaper funding, not by a whole lot, but uh, two to three basis points in our experience through issuing green bonds. So, uh, and not least, um, uh, market recognition for the Communivest brand has increased substantially uh, as a result amongst uh, investors, policymakers, and regulators. Uh, as you're, you're aware, uh, green financing is very much the, the flavor of the moment and the green bond market has been growing substantially. And by being an active and large player in this market, uh, uh, Communivest, the brand recognition for Communivest has been, uh, uh, has been uh, much improved. Uh, in terms of, yes. Yeah. No, I was. Uh, did you have anything else to add? I was going to say thank you very much for the comprehensive answer. But if you have something else, please go ahead. Well, I didn't. I didn't come to the green benefits. We actually think that uh, by engaging in green um, provides an opportunity for the, the financial industry to support uh, the transition to a sustainable society, and we hope that our green loan, green bonds framework can help to. Uh, catalyze change within the local governments. And as I tried to explain in my presentation, we see that happening w with at least some of our uh, members. Uh, and that's a very positive thing, we think. Absolutely. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, we've had uh, more than one question, actually, maybe for uh, Lars and Jean-Francois around uh, setting up some of these entities in developing countries and perhaps given the, the um, issue around credit worthiness in many of these countries, especially for uh, municipal entities, uh, what could the role of uh, multilateral development banks or national development banks be? Do you think there is a big role in, in those countries or are there other strategies to uh, improve the credit worthiness of these entities that should also be taken into account? Well, if I, I were to, to, to start, I think that there should certainly be a role for, for, for these um, uh, international entities in the beginning, uh, w if you want to, to um, start with pool financing. Uh, but, you know, it has to be done in a way that it could be phased out, the, the, the support from these, because in the end, it should rely on the local authorities, and and um, there should be a program in place to 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 uh, build the credit worthiness of of the, the local authorities. But certainly, there is a role for for the international financing entities in the beginning to help uh, kickstart the these initiatives. Yeah. Maybe to just to complete that also what we we said and what uh, Lars said is the, um, there is a need first step is uh, to uh, make a, a good effort on communication uh, to acknowledge uh, local authorities and uh, the condition of success of um, 
all pool financing, and then also uh, to have a, um, a multi-level dialogue with uh, between local level and central level. And I think the, um, the, the, the role of uh, DFIs and uh, financial partners are crucial in that phase. It's really to support um, uh, those, uh, those first steps and uh, showing that there is also uh, external support uh, to develop those mechanisms. Because, for example, in South Africa, we saw that uh, there, was, um, uh, th there was a reluctance from the central government to, uh, to allow uh, local authorities to develop green bonds. So uh, having AFD, the World Bank, AFC, and uh, others uh, saying that it, it is a good way, uh, I think it uh, it helps it helps to uh, to go forward on that. And then also with the the instruments from the DFIs, for example, the World Bank, they have the um, the PEFA uh, tool that uh, helps to uh, to see how to uh, improve the credit worthiness uh, to to provide a picture of uh, of uh, the state of the local authorities on, uh, on finance. So I think in uh, emerging and developing countries, the, their role are, are, are levels. Just to make a comment on, on, on or, or to continue, um, um, I want to say that the process of, of um, you know, starting pool financing, it actually addresses all the questions concerned in, in, in decentralization. So, uh, this process is very, very useful in, from, from different points of view in developing country because it, it addresses the question of, of the relationship between central and local government. It, it addresses the, the um, um, transfer system, uh, different ways of, of uh, working together the legal system. So just the process is worthwhile. Uh, but then again, it should be the um, it, it 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 has a high probability of of ending with a very good um, cooperation between local authorities. Thank you very much. I think we just have room maybe for a couple more short questions, uh, and then we will have to close. Jan, um, maybe this one is more for you. Uh, uh, how do you see the developments in Europe in terms of the taxonomy standard affecting uh, any of the work uh, done so far? or any future green bonds that Communivest is looking to issue? Uh, yes, thank you. Well, uh, I would say that in general, we are, we are very favorable towards the development that we now see on the EU level with regards to developing a, a taxonomy and a, a green, green bond standard. Uh, <clears throat> with regards to the green bond standard, I don't foresee that having uh, a whole lot of impact on or making anything change uh, for us. However, the taxonomy might, uh, uh, depending, uh, for those of you who've seen the taxonomy, it's a lot of details around which type of economic activities can be deemed sustainable uh, on a Euro European wide level. Uh, uh, and as always, when you have to agree on something amongst uh, very many member states, uh, it's not impossible to foresee a situation where possibly we, we need to adjust some of the eligibility criteria uh, that we have for our framework. Uh, generally speaking, Sweden tends to be relatively uh, advanced in terms of uh, the type of buildings that we construct and, and uh, uh, the criteria we apply for a range of activities. So I don't foresee it having uh, too much of an impact, but in some nitty-gritty details, we, we will probably need to adapt uh, our framework to the uh, taxonomy that is being developed. Loud and clear. And I think maybe just to give also a bit more um, color to some of the participants, obviously the, uh, the taxonomy and green bond standard process under development in the European Union is, w will, will probably take the whole of next year or there will be some first results in June. Already there are some uh, activities from the taxonomy that are out uh, and everyone can give feedback on it. So. I think in any case, there is also an interest to build on current market practices since the green bond market in Europe has been going a lot over the past few years and there has already been some excellent um, market practices such as on 
on impact reporting, as Bjorn was mentioning before, that um, the group will also try to leverage and obviously bring into the European guidance. So there will be, I think, a lot of opportunity also for market participants to actually feed what they have been doing over, over the past few years. Um, I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. Uh, we have uh, um, noted some of the other questions that we didn't uh, have time to ask our panelists, but we will try to get back to you. Um, and we will also email all the slides, and obviously the recording of this webinar will also be available on our YouTube channel. So thank you very much to everyone who has listened in, and obviously thanks a lot to Bjorn, Jean-Francois, and Lars um, who were with us today. Thank you.